From the time an American child reaches the sixth grade, they are taught that the key to success in life is to do well in high school so that they can get accepted to the best possible college. The better grades they get in high school, the better college they will have an opportunity to get into. They are taught that if they get into a great college and get their college degree, any type of job they desire in the field of their choice will be there waiting for them. After getting their dream job, they will be able to buy any car and house they desire, start their own family, and live the American dream. Most Americans today have an expectation of future economic success simply by obtaining a college degree. The entire purpose of elementary school is to prepare students for high school, and the entire purpose of high school is to prepare students for college. In fact, the U.S. now has hundreds of private college preparatory high schools that, at a cost of $25,000 per year, are supposed to increase students' chances of getting into a top-tier college. Students are taught to believe that if they don't go to college, they will be on a path to nowhere and will have no chance of ever building a successful career. Government regulations like No Child Left Behind have left grade and high schools in shambles. Instead of teachers having the freedom to think outside the box and use creative techniques to prepare their students for the real world, they are forced to be narrow-minded and teach with worthless information that will never help their students have successful careers. Today, there are no high schools left in America that teach students the knowledge necessary to start their own business, invent their own product, or even how to use the internet and other free resources to become educated about things without attending college. The annual cost to attend the average private four-year college in America today is $27,293, up 29% from five years ago during the 2005-2006 school year when the annual tuition cost $21,235. This does not include the cost of textbooks, which have tripled over the past decade. Colleges are now charging $200 for each single textbook that has no resale value because they put out new, slightly revised versions with a new name each year. The textbook publishers are even colluding with college bookstores to make custom textbooks so that students can't save money by buying them online. Colleges are getting kickbacks from publishers in order to destroy the used textbook market, which by itself is proof enough that college administrators are only interested in lining their own pockets and have no interest in helping their students. You have to have a certain kind of brain to understand the dead language that they write in textbooks. But they brainwash you from a little kid up so that you buy into the system and you get good grades and you study hard and then you become a member of the total system. No freedom. You don't know how to think because they told you how to think their way. College tuition has seen 5.15% annual price inflation over the past five years. This is despite the fact that U.S. real estate prices are down 26% from their peak in July of 2006. And the Dow Jones is down 18% from its peak in October of 2007. Even oil is down 38% from its peak in July of 2008. During the financial crisis of 2008, Americans lost $10.2 trillion in paper wealth. And college is the only thing in America, besides the cost of health care, that did not at least temporarily decline in price. Inflation has made it impossible. Again, when I was a kid, it wasn't, you never heard parents saying, we're planning and putting money away for your education because it's going to cost us $100,000 and we have to keep putting that money away so that when you graduate, not only will you not pay us back, you're not even going to get a job.
Over just a two-year period from December of 2007 through December of 2009, 8,363,000 jobs in America were lost, or 6.1% of total jobs. One year later, in December of 2010, thanks to the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government spending $4.6 trillion on bailouts, stimulus programs, and other government spending, 1.124 million jobs in America, or 0.9% of total jobs, had been recovered. That is over $4 million spent for each job created. As we move into deeper into this great recession, that we believe as inflation continues to skyrocket, the reality of a Great Depression will come in because people will realize that all that worthless money you have can't buy you much of anything. You're going to see more and more people, as they're already doing it, believing that they're, by going to college, that's going to be their passport to the future. It's not what it used to be. A degree, a college degree, a BS, what does that buy you? And I love the mentality. The mentality is this, that corporations and businesses won't hire a person unless they get a degree. <laughs> Not me. I don't care if you have a degree. It makes absolutely no difference. I want you to have a mind, be able to think for yourself and think on your feet. And be energetic and love what you're doing and have a passion in so many different other ways. Not to be able to just regurgitate what, what you're being told. And that's all it's come to, it's regurgitation. During an economic downturn when Americans are losing their jobs, their primary instinct is to seek higher education in order to make themselves more attractive to potential employers and better position themselves to receive a job. However, how are Americans supposed to spend $27,293 per year for college when they have no savings or income to pay for it? The U.S. government, with the backing of the Federal Reserve, in the same way they created the real estate bubble, by providing mortgages to all Americans through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, regardless of whether or not they had any capacity to pay the loans back, has been using the exact same easy lending practices to create one of the largest bubbles in U.S. history, the college bubble. College students borrowed $106 billion in total student loans for the 2009-2010 school year, up from $96 billion in 2008-2009, $94 billion in 2007-2008, $87 billion in 2006-2007, and $83 billion in 2005-2006. Total student loan debt in the U.S. currently stands at $830 billion and now exceeds credit card debt. I was so pro-education. That's all I wanted in my life was an education. And, and you know, I'd like to still be pro-education, right. but to put anybody through what I've been through... No. Really, in my case, the education, I think, really ruined my life. Right. So, I mean, I would have been better off if I just would have gone to work at, you know, McDonald's or something, <laughs> actually. Uh -huh. so. That is unbelievable. Because yeah, this is a debt I can never get over. The U.S. government created Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in order to make housing more affordable. But instead, their actions drove housing prices through the roof and made buying a house impossible for most Americans unless they took out no money down teaser loans with interest rates that substantially increased after a year or two. The U.S. government has been trying for decades to make college more affordable, but its actions have accomplished the complete opposite effect. College is now impossible for most students to afford without getting deeply into debt to do so. All across the country, Americans are graduating college with mortgages before they even buy a house. When I graduated from my undergraduate degree, I had $300 in student loans that I owed. $300. 
you know, you can you can hardly buy two cups of coffee and a and a and a meal at the student union these days for three hundred bucks. So when I graduated with my undergraduate degree, uh, what what you got in exchange for your education was lifetime indenture and a new house. Right, so you got to buy the mortgage. That's what you got. You got your degree. You got out of school. You, you got a job, and therefore you bought a house because culture drives you to buy a house. So now you're in debt. You have to work. Now you have to be part of the, the wage slave economy for the next 20 or 30 years until the house is paid off. These days, college is the new house, and you don't even get the house. As soon as you get out of school, you're indentured for life. When you started taking out loans, what kind of debt did you end up getting into, and how much have you been able to pay off, and how much I, you still have? I was, when I walked out of dental school, I was $136,000 in debt, um, and I have paid in close to $100,000 right now. They say I owe $300,000, uh, so I still have quite a bit, obviously, that I can't manage anymore. Um, and I've done everything I can to try to manage it, but it becomes unmanageable at a certain point. One of the loans, the HEAL loan, um, was a um, health occupation loan. And when that defaulted, um, then it, I can no longer um, see Medicare or Medicaid patients. So it's, I'm very selective of where I can even work anymore. Wow. Because I'm, it's, it ties my hands. As I, if I wanted to go into indigent care or one of the free clinics or something, I couldn't. Right. When I was first told this, I was told by my attorney, that I would not get Medicare or Medicaid. I said, well, okay, you know what I mean? There's not much I can do. And for many years, that's what I believed because that's what he thought right. it meant. Well, comes to find out that's not what it was at all. It was that I was not able to work on patients in Medicare wow. or Medicaid. Wow. And so um, when I went to work for uh, this place that I'm working, um, I thought we were fine because we don't take them. Well, there happens to be some federal employees that now I can't see I didn't even realize that. And so when the office manager, when we realized it, the office manager sent a note to him and said, you know, what's the deal? And they said, well, she knows all about this. <laughs> no, I don't know about it. Neither do the attorneys and neither does anybody else. I mean, this, these laws are so vague. It's just amazing. So now I have to watch who I see. Um, and fortunately, my employer has worked with me or I would be out of a job, basically. Um, but they're very... Um, vague and uh, they keep you in the dark uh, they don't really um, try to help you or figure any of this out they don't work with you I know there's the new income based repayment but I don't fall into any of that you know so I don't know I just don't want to see it happen to anybody else right. that's there's, my problem there's no compassion right. there's, there's no, no, help. Yeah. no help no compassion nothing they're just vultures Back in the 1970s, the average college student was able to afford their college tuition without any student loans or help from their parents. They were able to pay for college by working a part-time job year-round or by simply working full-time during the summer when they were off from school. Not only that, but they were also able to afford their own car payments and possibly a small apartment. The U.S. government destroyed this by providing easy student loans to anybody who applied for them without any credit requirements. Over the past decade, any 18-year-old has had the ability to take out large student loans without even being asked if they have a job, what their high school grades were, what they intend to major in, or any other information that would help determine their future ability to pay back the loan. These are, uh, this is a paper, and this is, of course, a copy, I have the original, of what they gave me the day I graduated from dental school. What amount, uh, income level I would have to make, and how much of that would go to school loans, and um, what percentage. First off, I never even made enough in a month to pay the monthly uh, school loan uh, amount, so... Uh, that's why it went into default. Right. And they basically made just completely unrealistic Unrealistic. Un totally make, unrealistic, right? yes. Um, I've, I've not even managed to make any of them wow. at all. So um, uh, this year, of course, they're projecting I would clear about 260000 oh, And man. I'm making about eighty. 
And where do they so, come up with these numbers? Well, I'm not sure, and I, I, I mean, think I think that was the whole problem. Over four hundred thousand in, in two thousand and fifteen, oh, which wow. will not ever happen. The problem is it also is your percentage of of your school of what they're taking. Um, I know it's been proposed at ten percent, and I think that is a fair amount. But at some points, I pay as much as. 34% of my wage, 32% of my wage. Right now I'm paying 25% of my wage to uh, school loans. And uh, that's a huge amount when you have other debts and other bills as well. Thank you so much. Mary. No, thank you very, very much for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate the help. Today, two-thirds of students are graduating college with an average student loan debt of $24,000. And the government is now making the situation many times worse by completely taking over the student loan business. Hidden inside of the recently passed health care bill, the government passed a complete student loan overhaul where they removed commercial banks from providing loans to students. Now, all students will receive their loans directly from the government at artificially low interest rates. There's absolutely no reason why we, the taxpayers, should be funding college education. And that's what we're doing when they're giving government aid. You know what my college debt was when I got out of school? $1,500. $1,500. You talk about inflation? You talk about inflation? You know what used to cost me a whole year to go to school? 2000 bucks, And that included room and board. You want to talk about inflation? You're never going to be able to get out from that debt. You're an indentured servant. That's right. That $120,000 you owe, the $80,000, the $40,000, the $250,000 if you're a good student that went to law school and you're that much in debt without a job. You have to pay it back. There is no way out. That's the system. One of the unintended consequences of the Wall Street bailouts of 2008 is that now most American students believe that if they take out loans to attend college but can't find a job to pay them back, they will be bailed out by the government and have the loans forgiven. NIA believes this is indeed what will ultimately happen, and therefore it will be U.S. taxpayers who end up paying for the artificially inflated, sky-high tuitions for all college students who can't or choose not to repay their loans. It won't only be taxpayers who suffer. All holders of U.S. dollars worldwide will ultimately pay for everybody's student loans, as the Federal Reserve is likely to print the money to make up for these bad debts, which will lead to hyperinflation and a worthless U.S. dollar. Many students are outright abusing the system. Although government student loans get sent directly to the college or university to pay for a student's tuition, private student loans that are guaranteed by the government usually get sent directly to the student in the form of a check. NIA has been hearing countless reports of students using this free student loan money to buy food, electronics, clothing, jewelry, even cars. The friend of one NIA member used his student loan money to rent and furnish a fancy apartment in Manhattan and didn't even go to college. Even when the loan comes directly from the government and goes straight to the college, there is often thousands of dollars left over each semester after tuition is paid for. This extra money then gets dispersed directly to the student in the form of a check. There is an epidemic in America of students using their student loan money for non-educational purposes and absolutely nothing is being done to stop this from happening. This is complete insanity and all Americans will pay for the madness in the very near future. One NIA member from Kansas City, Missouri has a wife who was one semester short of obtaining her teacher's degree. Instead of borrowing the $8,000 required for tuition at Northwest Missouri State University, she took out a government student loan for $13,000 and used the extra $5,000 to buy a used car. Unfortunately, shortly before graduating, Kansas City closed several schools and laid off 300 teachers. She is now working at a school cafeteria for $8.50 an hour. 
Although she was required to make monthly payments of $146 for 10 years, after calling the government student loan office and inquiring about their income-based payment plan, they agreed to reduce her monthly payments to zero. With all the modern technological advances the world has been experiencing in recent years, the cost of a quality college education in America should be getting cheaper. It is now cheaper to purchase a plasma television or laptop computer than years ago because the government doesn't subsidize purchases of these products. If there was a true free market in college education, colleges would be figuring out more cost-efficient ways to educate students using modern technology in order to bring tuitions down and compete against each other for the enrollment of students. By guaranteeing student loans and providing too much financial aid to students, the U.S. government destroyed the free market in college education. One NIA member who is 50% owner of a private vocational school tells us that he is legally forced to raise tuitions every time the government raises financial aid to students. The government's 90-10 rule mandates that at least 10% of a private for-profit college's income comes from non-federal government sources. Therefore, private for-profit colleges must keep raising tuitions to stay within the 90-10 rule. The government needs to get out of the education business completely and allow private banks to re-enter the market and compete against each other in order to offer loans at reasonable interest rates to students who will have the best ability to pay them back. The reality is the majority of the students who qualify for loans today from the government would no longer qualify but this will force colleges to either bring down their expenses in order to charge affordable tuitions or close their doors for good. Colleges in America spent $10.7 billion on construction projects in 2009, down from an average $14.7 billion spent per year from 2005 to 2007, but still very excessive. Colleges have recklessly spent to build new libraries, gyms, sports arenas, housing units, etc., all for the purpose of impressing potential students and their families. None of these projects have added anything to the quality of college education in the U.S. Many colleges have very large levels of debt they undertook to build new construction. With most college endowment funds being crushed in recent years due to collapsing real estate and stock market prices, many colleges have very poor balance sheets that won't be able to withstand the slightest drop in enrollments. Jocks! Grown-up jocks! Excuse me, the coaches now. Hey, coach. Making millions of dollars. For well, what does this have to do with education? What a waste. What a waste. Two-bit universities fielding baseball teams, football teams, basketball teams. For what? To entertain the kids? Yeah, you could do this if you're a very rich society and you have the money to waste. But not during a great recession. And not as the median household income of the country continues to decline and not as you're sending all of these kids to get degrees in worthlessness, because that's what these university degrees are, a lot of them. It's a waste of money, it's a waste of energy, and it's an affront to anyone who really wants to think seriously about an education, because it has nothing to do with the NCAA. We are sort of seeing the perfect storm. We have seen all this construction in the past few years, and if you're a college president, putting your name on a building is quite nice. But you are not there, you probably have moved on somewhere else while your name is on the building, but now the operation and maintenance costs are now falling due. And that was never part of the original bond issue, so now we have all these facilities coming online. Students you know, are being stressed financially, parents are being stressed financially, tuition is going up like crazy, even those schools that are lucky to have endowments Typically, they're not having the return they used to have in the old days. So there is just this tremendous you know, culmination of things all coming together that is just going to just stress the system completely. You know, we just saw that there were even riots in UCLA when they saw a 32% increase 
in tuition. I mean, do you think that we'll start to see a lot more you know, riots and students getting angry at these tuition prices? I would love to see a little more activism on my on the part of my students. I think they have been taking this now for such such a long time that maybe it's just part of the scenery now, and they're not not really worried about it anymore. And I also think a person that's 20 years old, 22 years old, does not realize the implications of not being able to escape student loan debt. When I was in college, when I was in my high school years, at that time, many people were going to college, borrowing the money to go as far as all the way through medical school. And when they graduate from medical school or law school, they would simply just up and declare bankruptcy. But in its wisdom, a few years ago, as you probably know, Congress changed those rules in that you can no longer discharge student loan debt through bankruptcy. And now, even if you happen to make it to Social Security and you still owe the money, they're going to come after your Social Security check if it exists, which I don't think it will. With NIA projecting all U.S. interest rates to rise dramatically over the next few years to multi-decade highs, many colleges will likely be forced to double or triple their average tuition inflation rate to 10 or 15 percent just to cover rising interest payments. As the word spreads about this documentary and Americans become educated to the truth, more and more students will wake up to the fact that college education is the largest scam in American history. We are about to reach a point where students say enough is enough and refuse to pay higher tuition prices. There are currently a total of 4,168 public and private two and four year colleges in the U.S. In the near future, as the U.S. dollar begins to collapse and American families are forced to spend more than 30% of their income on food, we expect to see a sharp contraction in the number of colleges in America. NIA conservatively believes 20% of American colleges will close by the year 2020. Of the colleges that remain open, NIA projects an average decline in enrollments by the end of this decade of between 15 and 30%. In fact, enrollments by American students in each college could decline by as much as 50%, with Chinese students using their soon-to-be strong yuan to become educated in the U.S. and price American students out of the market. NIA also projects for most colleges to reduce their faculty sizes by between 25% and 40%, which will mean larger class sizes and a further decline in the quality of education. If we were doing such a wonderful job and producing such geniuses coming out of universities, you think we'd be in the problems that we're in now? Do you think that we would be among the most unhealthy nation of people in developed nations? Do you think that we would be gobbling down junk food? Do you think that we would be prescription drug addicts as a society? Do you think that we would be in the greatest recession that's heading toward the greatest depression? Do you think we would be in Iraq and wasting trillions of dollars fighting losing wars in Afghanistan and now in Pakistan? Do you think that we would have Presidents and senators and congressmen and legislators of such low mentality that we have now? Do you think that we would have the rampant greed of the white shoe boys on Wall Street if the universities were turning out anything of quality considering the trillions that are spent and the tens of millions that are educated by their deeds you shall know them look what American universities have produced the simple truth is any American high school student who has any savings put away that they are planning to spend on college would be much better off simply investing this money into physical silver a senior in high school with $30,000 in savings who buys physical silver today will likely have enough money to buy the median U.S. home four years from now. 
while all of their friends will be graduating college with no job or money to buy a house, but will be stuck with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and a worthless piece of paper called a college degree. How worthless is education? Let me count the ways in my worthless college degree. Worthless. That's what a college degree is worth. Here's my worthless law degree. Equally as worthless. Here's my worthless license to practice law. Worthless. And here's my worthless computer science degree. Also worthless. That's the value of education. If somebody were graduating from high school today and wanted to know whether they should go to college, I would say they should run, not walk, away from college. Because the industrial age doesn't have long to go. There's, there's no way that I would encourage somebody to go four years or more to undergraduate school rack up a bunch of debt, and learn a bunch of nonsense that isn't going to do them any good when there's no fuel at the filling station, no food at the grocery store, and no water coming out of the municipal taps. Well, why would you go to college to go into a huge amount of debt to get nothing in return, not even something that might facilitate your survival, much less your ability to thrive? So at this point, at this late era in the industrial economy, I wouldn't encourage anybody to go to college. It hasn't been a, a very good deal for quite a while, and it certainly is a really bad deal now. I confer upon you the degree for which you have worked so hard, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto. Congratulations. As fast as college tuition costs are rising, the value of a college degree is declining even faster. The youth in America today need to be taught to think for themselves and realize that there is no value to having a college degree if everyone else has one. I was in the student union where graduation was about to take place and they had a series of plaques on the wall. And they listed all the students who had graduated with a 4.0 grade point average. And the first plaque had, you know, all, all the plaques were basically full of names, but the first plaque had the first 50 or 60 years of the university represented. To fill that plaque with the 20 or so names on it required 50 or 60 years of higher education. Of course, in the most recent five years, there are multiple plaques for every year. We're churning out 4.0 students at the rate of a couple hundred a year. That used to mean something. You know, if, if you're the, the only person that in the first 40 years of the history of the institution to have a 4.0, that's meaningful. Now everybody's a four-point student. Our standards have fallen so profoundly that anybody with a, with a heartbeat can get a four point average. It's just absurd. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported in April of last year that as of October 2009, 70.1% of 2009 high school graduates were enrolled in colleges or universities, an all-time high since they began keeping this statistic and up from 68.6% of 2008 high school graduates enrolling into college. In other words, there is no longer anything special about a college degree in America if 70% of everybody else is also attending college to receive one. NIA is working hard to ensure that it will soon become common knowledge in the U.S. that a college degree gives you no advantage over the rest of the population. When Americans finally learn the truth, the college bubble in America will burst. College enrollment has been increasing really since the late 80s. 
But um, what kind of is an unknown secret is uh, since 1992, the um, majority of college graduates, um, 60% of them, were in positions that the BLS considered low scale and typically did not require a high school education. Uh, for example, uh, 20% of all the new waiter and waitressing positions created since 1992 have been filled by college graduates. Of the 29.9% of recent high school graduates not in college, 70% of them were able to successfully find jobs without a college degree. These Americans are already building important workforce experience, which NIA considers to be far more valuable than any piece of paper. By comparison, only 42.1% of recent high school graduates in college have a job and most of these are part-time jobs where the students are building very little workforce experience. The 57.9% of students in college without jobs, not only are they wasting their savings and getting deeply into debt for a worthless piece of paper, but they are losing out on valuable income they could have been earning during those four years. One of the greatest myths in America today that is used to scam Americans into overpaying to attend college is that college graduates make more money in their lives than Americans without college degrees, and therefore a college degree is a great investment. According to studies from biased organizations like the College Board, Americans with college degrees will earn $1 million in additional income over their lifetime compared to high school graduates with no college degrees. You know that college graduates earn a million dollars more on average than those without a degree? Graduates from four-year colleges earn nearly an estimated one million dollars more. Most colleges and universities in America use this one million dollars in additional income statistic to hype and sell their product. It has been repeated so many times that it's just about been accepted by all with nobody questioning its validity. However, for any student thinking of attending college, they need to consider the facts surrounding this number and compare it to the true cost of attending college. With the cost of annual college tuition now at $27,293, if we assume continued 5.15% college tuition inflation over the next four years, the average cost for a student entering college now to receive their bachelor's degree in four years will be $117,900. Therefore, even with the current college inflation crisis, an expenditure of $117,900 on the surface seems like a good investment if the return will be $1 million. The secret truth is, most college students do not receive their degree in four years. The Americans who are earning $1 million more in their lifetimes are actually spending an average of six years in college before receiving their degrees. Therefore, assuming continued 5.15% college tuition inflation for years five and six, the total cost for the average student's degree in order to earn their $1 million in extra income will be $186,349. For those who borrow that full amount and pay it back over 10 years at a 6% interest rate, the additional interest expense would be $61,914, bringing the total cost of the degree up to $248,263. Then you need to consider the matter of lost income. The average high school graduate who finds an entry-level job without a college degree earns $35,400 per year over the first six years. For the majority of college students who don't have jobs, they are losing $212,400 in income over their six years in college. Combining the expected cost to attend college for six years with potential interest expenses and lost income, and now we are at a total cost of $460,663, all for the hope of earning an extra $1 million over a lifetime. Another important fact is, all of the reports that show $1 million in extra income for college graduates over high school graduates include students who receive GEDs as being high school graduates. Most GED recipients weren't motivated enough to graduate high school and therefore shouldn't be included in these statistics as real high school graduates. 
NIA believes GED recipients are unfairly skewing down high school graduates' average incomes. Also, the simple truth is, some Americans are just more motivated than others to make money and have successful careers. Somebody who wants to earn a high income usually goes to college because they have been suckered into believing it offers them the greatest ability to do so. Whereas most Americans who don't attend college don't have as strong a desire to have a successful career. 95% of college graduates interviewed by NIA with annual incomes above $200,000 tell us that their college degrees had absolutely nothing to do with their business success. In fact, of these same people surveyed, 90% of them said that they probably would have become successful at a much earlier age and be making even more money today if they didn't waste so many years of their life attending college. The phony $1 million in additional income study that was conceived by the education industry in order to deceive Americans into overpaying to attend college is just one of many false misleading studies that they have created in an effort to create an illusion that college is a good investment no matter how high tuition prices rise. The mainstream media has been working with the education industry and helping them perpetrate their schemes on the American public. One of these schemes was the 2008 pharmacist shortage hoax. Three years ago, there were 15 new pharmacist schools getting ready to open in the U.S. In order to create artificial demand for enrollments to all of these new schools, the industry decided to create an illusion that there was a huge shortage of pharmacists in the country that will continue for the rest of the decade with 150,000 new pharmacist jobs needed by 2020. One place where the U.S. economy has too many jobs and not enough applicants is in pharmacies. Because there's a shortage of pharmacists, many are overworked from putting in long hours. With pharmacies open 24 hours a day and a huge population of aging baby boomers consuming larger amounts of prescription drugs, it adds up to an industry that cannot find enough pharmacists to go around. From the, the, the student standpoint, and our students know that uh, when they graduate, they have a job. I mean, in fact, they have a job even before they have graduated. Uh, it's not that they can practice as a pharmacist, but they know they have been, been offered already a job. So that's one of the positive side. Uh, on the negative side is, is the pressure that's put on the schools to really come up with the number of pharmacists that, that are needed in the future. By some estimates, the U.S. would need more than 150,000 new pharmacists by 2020 to match supply with industry demand. Experts say the pharmacist shortage will continue for at least a decade or more. In the meantime, at least 15 new pharmacy schools are expected to open their doors by 2010, even as existing schools expand in size. NIA has been hearing dozens of reports from its members with family members who have graduated pharmacy schools six months to a year ago and have sent in their resumes to hundreds of different pharmacies in the New York metropolitan area and have yet to even receive one job offer. Even experienced pharmacists are having major difficulties finding pharmacist jobs. The husband of one NIA member retired five years ago as a pharmacist in New Jersey but has now decided to re-enter the workforce so that their family can accumulate enough gold and silver to survive hyperinflation. Unfortunately, he was forced to leave his family and move to a rural part of Alabama in order to receive a pharmacist job paying only $18 per hour. Law schools have also been deceiving the public with false and misleading statistics. During the past decade, an unprecedented number of Americans went to school to become lawyers because they thought if they became a lawyer, they would immediately become rich. Some law schools are advertising that 90% of graduates are employed within one year of graduating. The unfortunate reality is, law schools are deceiving their students with these statistics because most of their graduates who are employed within a year of graduating are not employed at law firms. They can be employed at Walmart or McDonald's, but the law schools will still consider them to be part of their 90% employed within a year. A lot of schools right now will tout a job placement rate after graduation or you know what percentage of their graduates are employed X amount of months after graduating the degree. Um, and what you're seeing sometimes in the, is, is manipulation and outright just fraud in how they, they calculate this. Um, one major law school was recently 
admitted to hiring a bunch of, of unemployed illegal graduates to work in their admissions group at the same time their placement rate survey was being conducted. So yes, were they employed at the time? Yes, but it was an illegal profession. Law schools are handing out 43,000 law degrees each year, yet 15,000 attorney and legal staff jobs have disappeared since 2008. Many people wonder why 60% of the U.S. Senate and 37% of the U.S. House of Representatives are lawyers. Well, the reason is they go to Washington in order to pass as many new harmful and destructive laws and regulations as possible in order to provide enough work for all of their lawyer friends. So I decided to go to law school. I went to Chapman University School of Law. I graduated in 2005 and passed the bar in uh, 2005, July of that year. And uh, overall, I did not have a good experience in law school. In fact, the first week going into law school, it was not at all what I expected. I thought that the law was to promote freedom and liberty and justice. And in fact, what I, what I realized uh, shortly after entering law school is what the law has become is uh, an excuse for bureaucrats to regulate just about every aspect of our behavior. All of the needless legislation that is passed each year in order to provide work for lawyers has the devastating unintended consequence of destroying what little is left of the free market. Small businesses are the backbone of the U.S. economy, but it is now nearly impossible for a small businessman with limited financial resources to build a large successful corporation in any sector because their legal costs would eat up all of their capital needed for research and development. Lawyers do very little to add real value to society. In fact, most legal and financial related service jobs on Wall Street are made possible solely due to inflation. It is because of the Federal Reserve's 0% interest rates and trillions of dollars in bailouts that all of these jobs exist. But these jobs only exist because money is being stolen from middle class goods producing workers and being redistributed to non-producing workers on Wall Street. A lot of people that I graduated with found law to be very similar to how I found it, and that is it wasn't really about helping people or benefiting the community. It was really just a system whereby bureaucratic lawyers make money trying to interpret, it, interpret complex statutes that really serve no purpose. There is a law for just about everything. You want to marry somebody who you love, you have to get a license to do that. You want to develop the real property that you purchased, you have to go to the city and get permits and licenses to do that. Um, you need permits and licenses to do just about everything that should be legal because you're not hurting anybody else. To start your own business, you need a business license, you need your taxpayer ID number, you need all kinds of things just to get up and running. And so all these restrictions and laws and statutes, a lot of them which are not even passed by Congress, they're simply passed by administrative bureaucracies, uh, they hamper the economy, they hamper economic growth, and they actually act in a tyrannical sense against people starting their own businesses and providing for themselves. 75 years ago, agriculture made up 28% of the U.S. GDP. Today, the service sector makes up 76.9% of GDP, and agriculture makes up only 1.2%. The only way for a country to produce real wealth is by farmers growing food, miners mining for gold, silver, and other precious metals, drillers drilling for oil, natural gas, and other commodities, and manufacturers manufacturing real goods that can be exported to the rest of the world. Goldman Sachs has never created one dime of wealth for our country, yet most politicians in Washington have been brainwashed into believing Wall Street jobs are necessary for the U.S. to have a strong, viable economy. Likewise, nearly all Americans who have gone to school during the past decade have gone to school for degrees in legal, financial, or other service sector jobs. Almost no Americans have gone to college to become farmers, gold miners, or oil drillers. You can go to college and learn from somebody that doesn't have a farm, and they'll give you an ag business degree. You know, most of the people teaching college don't have a farm, don't know how to manage it, and don't want a farm. I say if you want to learn how to do something, 
try to study under the person that can do it the best that he can do. There, there are jobs everywhere. You have to create a job. You don't get a job, you make one. Americans have taken food for granted for far too long. Because Americans have been able to buy food at artificially low prices, with the average American family spending only 10% of their income on food. However, on October 30th, 2009, NIA published an article predicting inflation would appear next in food and agriculture. NIA said, a worldwide shortage of farmers combined with food inventories falling to record lows is setting up the perfect storm for an explosion in agriculture prices. From the time NIA wrote this article until now, we have experienced the largest ever short-term increase in agricultural commodity prices. Corn has risen by 75%, wheat by 65%, soybeans have risen 51%, sugar 45%, orange juice has risen by 58%, coffee has risen 71%, and cotton has risen 124%. Because very few Americans went to school to become a farmer and everybody needs to eat, agricultural commodity prices will continue to skyrocket and farmers are going to get wealthy in the years ahead while lawyers and bankers will see a dramatic decline in their standard of living. The free market will adjust and see to it that lawyers, bankers and other non-producing financial service workers see a 90% decline in their real incomes. Everybody can't be a college graduate. Somebody's got to grow food. You know, everybody can't ride the wagon. Somebody's got to pull it. Somebody's got to be taking some risks. Somebody's got to be thinking. Somebody's got to have sweat. Last summer, uh, this lady I was telling about that bought some cattle from us, she came here to get some cattle in August, and my grandson was downstairs splitting firewood, and we burned firewood in this building it saves us about $600 a month over burning propane. So uh, my grandson was cutting firewood and he was swinging the axe down here and splitting logs. And he it was August and it was about 95 degrees. And she came in here to sit down and she says, uh, there's a kid down there cutting firewood. He said the sweat's dripping off of his nose. I said, what'd he do wrong? <laughs> he didn't do anything wrong. It's his job. He's cutting firewood. That's her grandson. He's 14. You know, he'll cut, you know, six cords of firewood a day. That's what he does. The only thing that has been supporting the U.S. service sector economy for so long is the U.S. dollar's status as the world's reserve currency and the world's willingness to hoard trillions of dollars in U.S. dollar reserves in order to trade oil and other valuable commodities. The U.S. dollar became the world's reserve currency because it was backed by gold and the U.S. had the world's leading manufacturing base. Today, the U.S. dollar is a fiat currency that is backed by nothing and our manufacturing base has been rapidly deteriorating with most of the products the world buys now made in China and other Asian countries. The Federal Reserve just announced that it will print another $600 billion dollars which will dilute the purchasing power of the U.S. Treasuries held by our creditor nations and cause them to soon abandon the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. The entire U.S. economy is a Ponzi scheme that is dependent on the rest of the world continuing to buy larger amounts of U.S. Treasuries. Pretty soon, not only will the world stop buying our Treasuries, but they will dump the Treasuries they already own. All of our deficit spending will have to be paid for by outright money printing. Although the government and media would like you to believe the U.S. economy is going through a recovery, the truth is the U.S. economy is on life support. It is impossible to have an artificial boom created by artificially low interest rates from the Federal Reserve without a major depression afterwards. The U.S. real estate bubble was the largest artificial boom in history. The panic of 2008 was the free market trying to correct the imbalances with a bust. But the Federal Reserve prevented a necessary depression from happening by taking trillions of dollars of worthless assets onto its balance sheet. 
None of the imbalances have been fixed, and the real depression is still to come. But unlike the depression of the 1930s, which saw falling prices, the upcoming depression will be a hyperinflationary Great Depression with prices for food, energy, and everything else Americans need to live and survive soaring through the roof. All young Americans today should be entering the workforce as soon as possible in order to generate enough income so they can accumulate physical gold and silver. When the U.S. dollar collapses, only those with gold and silver will be able to buy food and other goods needed to live and survive. Those with the most gold and silver will have the best chance of surviving the upcoming collapse of the U.S. dollar. Our country needs to wake up to the reality that the world is changing and Americans will need to undertake new methods of survival. The American mindset has become so obsessed with the belief that college is the key to success that by the time most people wake up to the truth, it'll be too late. One NIA member recently took his son to the doctor and the doctor asked his son if he was going to attend college. After his son said he doesn't know what he wants to do, the doctor went on for 10 minutes praising the virtues of a college education. Our member then explained to the doctor the realities of our new world and how college is a scam and no longer worth attending. The doctor didn't know what to say except, well, over time college graduates make more. NIA believes that the future of education is over the internet. Americans today can purchase just about any type of product they want over the internet for substantially less than they can find it in a retail store because online retailers have substantially less overhead costs. Walmart's biggest competitive threat today is not Target, but is actually Amazon.com, which now has a $79 billion market cap and is fast catching up to Walmart's $204 billion market cap. The largest and most profitable college of the future will be an online college that attracts all of the most successful professors from around the world and allows them to teach an unlimited number of students over the Internet. Students will have the opportunity to be taught by the very best in any field of their choice from the comfort of their own home. They will receive a much higher quality education for only a small fraction of the cost of attending a traditional college. By the end of this decade, NIA expects online colleges to gain at least a 25% market share of the total higher education industry. Well, you actually also teach online courses as well. I mean, do you think that that's the future, online learning? I think the future actually is online learning. If the grid can stay up, which I hope it does, I think most people have an interest in seeing that happen. So I think a lot of things could fall apart before the grid and the internet does. So I think that's the way. I always ask my students, does it really make a whole lot of sense for all 20 of us to drive here every Tuesday and Thursday to get together to talk about digital media stuff when we really could do this with a little bit of re-engineering and actually have Instead of all of us coming together, if I came to you wherever you were, I think that's a model of the future. If you figure out each, each student probably spends two gallons of gas a day to come to class, times 20 students, times 15 weeks, add up how much gas that is and how much that costs. Who wouldn't want to have that money back, especially over a couple of semesters? Especially now because we have a much richer media environment to use for teaching and learning. I can now embed videos in my classes. I can bring in things like the National Inflation Association videos to my classes. I can bring dynamic, compelling things to my class that even in the old days, if I was really a compelling speaker, it's far better now. So even a mediocre professor like me can make my class rich and interesting, even in the online environment. You tell me the difference about sitting in an auditorium in uh, NYU with a thousand other people or sitting in front of your screen and listening to a professor. What's the difference? Look what's going on in India. They estimate some 500,000 Indians have gotten university degrees in engineering through online, interactive view, is what I called it, back then. And well, how many did we turn out in the USA in the same period? Eh, about 150,000. It's the future. The future is now. But they're holding us back on real internet learning, real, 
real digital online learning because of the people that want to control the system, the ones that want to have the tenure. The whole college industrial complex, that's all it is. It's a racket, just like war's a racket, colleges have become a racket. While millions of Americans are at home right now wondering why are food and gas prices going through the roof, there is a small group of U.S. citizens that are preparing right now for the collapse of the U.S. dollar. These select few Americans will not only survive the upcoming hyperinflationary crisis, but they will be positioned to prosper and become wealthy as the rest of America is going to go broke. On December 11th of 2009, NAA declared silver the best investment for the next decade at only $17.40 per ounce. Just recently, we saw silver hit a high of nearly $50 per ounce for a gain of 185% for our members. In fact, in February of 2010, NIA suggested silver call options that ended up making a gain of over 1,000% at its high. You know, it amazes me how many people have been contacting us recently. I mean, every week we receive countless emails from people that say that they've learned more about economics from being a member of NIA for just one month compared to studying economics in college for over four years. NIA members receive weekly articles, videos, and updates with priceless economic information that the mainstream media is afraid to talk about. All across America, students are being brainwashed right now with Keynesian economic principles that got us in the debt crisis that we're in today. We are not going to solve our economic problems by making the same mistakes in the future. After the financial crisis in 2008, the U.S. should have went through a much needed recession where we saw the free market rebalance our economy from the ground floor. That way we would have built on a solid foundation, saw a real recovery with real economic growth in the future. A record 44.2 million Americans, or 14% of our population, are on food stamps right now to put food on the table. I mean, with the government about to go bust, these entitlement programs are a thing of the past. You know, two-thirds of Americans are getting ready to retire and actually believe that Social Security is going to be able to support 50% of their income. I mean, let's face it. Retirement in America is also going to be ancient history. Even Americans that have millions of dollars in the bank will soon go broke. The new wealthiest class of Americans are going to be the ones that become educated and start learning about the truth about our U.S. economy. Start thinking for yourself. Sign up and become a member of NIA for absolutely free at inflation.us.